Dr. Lois Graham. It's February 28th, 2011. We're in Canton, New York. Dr. Graham is a pioneer in women's engineering. She's here to talk to us about her experiences in women's engineering as well as in the engineering field itself. So, Dr. Graham, if you wouldn't mind just, just giving us a bit of background information about yourself from, from when you were younger and where the interest sparked. Okay. Um, when I was young, the thing that I really wanted to be was a doctor. And um, all the time, um, that was what I was planning on. Unfortunately, or fortunately in the long run, um, my sister was five years older than I was. And she went to college and the family had to borrow the money for her to go to college. So when it came time for me to go to college, there wasn't any money. <laughs> uh, this really was um, made quite a bit of difference as far as uh, education and medicine. So I tried to take my interest in that and see what I could do with it. In the same time, I was interested in flying. Um, Amelia Earhart was one of my models and she was um, a woman who crossed the Atlantic Ocean solo and that seemed like an awful nice thing to do. Well, how do you combine medicine with flying? At the time, you could, I thought about it, being a stewardess on an airline. Well, to be a stewardess, you had to be a nurse. That was okay. Right. <laughs> Unfortunately, you could not be any taller than five feet five and may weigh no more than a certain number of pounds. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Well, I outgrew that profession. <laughs> so I started thinking about my, uh, aeronautical engineering. Now, um, I was fortunate in that my father was on the faculty of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. That's in Troy, New York. And up to the time of the World War II, RPI would have been an exclusively male school. The, I had decided to go to State Teachers College in Albany and I was going to study physics with a minor in mathematics. The Saturday before school was to start, we got a call saying that RBI was going to accept women. Well, this had a huge advantage. Anybody who worked at RBI, their children could go to RBI free. Now, of course, up to that time, they had all been male. Right, right. <laughs> but the general rule still was in place, and that meant I could go to RPI without paying any tuition. And since I had a state scholarship, then I had my college paid for. Paid for entirely. Um, were you aware when you were younger, because your father worked at RPI, what the school was about, their involvement in engineering? When did yes. you when did you sort of learn about well the school? Because um, my father being on the faculty, of course I knew a lot of the faculty members. Right. And my my father was in the physical education department. Um, uh, he was a f professor of physical education. And I used to go to all the football games and all that sort of thing. Um, so I had a pretty good idea of what RPI was all about. When I enrolled, um, and told them that I wanted aeronautical engineering, they did suggest that I try mechanical engineering because it's a broader field 
and if you're in mechanical engineering, it's easy enough to get into aeronautical engineering. So when I started school, it was as mechanical engineering. As mechanical. Did you still have aspirations to, to involve yourself in aeronautical, or were you...? Um, I... Most schools that have a mechanical engineering department, if they don't have a separate aeronautical, uh, aeronautical is incorporated with the mechanical. And when I went to Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago, uh, their department was a combined uh, compartment, so department. So I um, really got into the aeronautical as well as the right. mechanical. I um, never did get a uh, license to fly. I did take some lessons um, while I, well. I was going to school during World War II, and things were very different from what they are now, in that all of the schools tended to have what is known as a speed-up program, which meant you went to school, um, including days like Thanksgiving you'd go to school. The only days you didn't go that were holidays were probably Christmas and New Year's. <laughs> So straight uh, through. Straight through. So I actually graduated two and two-thirds years instead of the usual four years. So you were very young when you graduated then. Were you still a teenager? I was just 20 when oh, I graduated. Oh my goodness. <laughs> very impressive. <laughs> and I went to work for Carrier Corporation in Syracuse. Um, that's the side of mechanical engineering that I was most interested in which is, I suppose you might say, the thermodynamic, or the energy size of, um, of uh, mechanical. And um, when I was there at, um, in Syracuse, after a year and a half, I was bored at my job. <laughs> and they told me I was too young to have more uh, responsibility. And I, I didn't go along with that, but I guess I really was quite young, considering right. that I had graduated when I was 20. <laughs> and um, so um, I decided that what I would do at that point is go back to school in order to get older. <laughs> Age a bit. <laughs> so I um, applied to several schools. Um, I applied to... Um, MIT, which I guess everybody knows. Um, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, right? Right. And they um, sent me an application form in which they wanted to know every book I used while I was in college, what parts of the book we covered and what parts we didn't. There was no way right. that Certainly I not. could do that. <laughs> And I'm sure even somebody in high school would have trouble doing something like that. Definitely. Um, so that was the end of MIT. Um, I went to a uh, flight at Cal California Institute of Technology, Caltech. And at that time, apparently Caltech didn't take women because I got a postcard from them in which they had crossed out everything the postcard said and simply wrote in, we do not take women. <laughs> oh my goodness. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry that I didn't save the postcard, but I didn't. <laughs> I'm sure that would be, yeah, Caltech would not be too pleased. I'm sure they're very happy that it's gone now. Yeah. That must have been, I mean, at the time, at now you laugh, but at the time was it, was it hard to read it, or did well, you just expect it? Was expected? kind of a shock. I mean, but uh, those are the things that were still happening at that time to women who wanted to go into engineering. So I had also written to Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago because there were two people who taught there that um, I respected very much. Uh, William Goodman, who was in the area of air conditioning, and Max Jacob, who was in the area of heat transfer. So I wrote to IIT 
and uh, applied there. Well, things were quite different. They offered me a graduate assistantship. So I went to IIT in Chicago and I ended up spending the next 39 years there in IIT. Oh, oh my gosh. Um, I not only got my master's there, but I also got my PhD. Um, and as far as I know, the PhD was the first PhD awarded to a woman, that's a PhD in mechanical engineering, right. awarded to a woman in the United States. Were you conscious of that while you were in the program or? Well, once... I, I was aware uh, that I was somewhat unique because all my classmates were male. Right, right. Um, the only time I ever had a class with a woman in it was when I specifically had tried to do so uh, when I was an undergraduate. Um, there, at RPI there was another woman who was studying metallurgical engineering. There was just the two women uh, at RPI. And, um, well, not, not quite. I'll take that back because there was a woman who was in architecture and another woman who was in um, chemistry. Um, but the two of us engineering students, uh, Mary Ellen was in the metallurgy, and um, so she and I arranged to have a, I think it was an English class together, <laughs> just so that we would have one class where there was another woman in it. Just the one. Yeah. Were you very close with the other females in your undergraduate, or no, no, no. there weren't any others. Right, just no. the just yeah. Mary Ellen in that one class. Yeah. So I understand when you were doing your masters and your PhD, you were a teaching assistant, weren't you? Or um, yeah. you, you taught a few classes. Were were all of your students male? Yes. Every one of them. How is how is that? Well, um. They might test me to make sure I understood what I was doing, but once they knew I knew what I was teaching, I didn't have any problems. One of the things that I did do was, of course, uh, participate in programs that were specifically designed uh, to encourage young women to go into engineering. Um, we worked with the high schools in order to um, have women experience some aspects of engineering so that they could consider it. Um, we found that the parochial schools were particularly good in seeing that their young women had science and mathematics, so they were prepared to go into engineering even if they hadn't considered it as a career. Uh, the thing is that when a woman, even myself, um, started thinking about college, the high school counselors would always talk about teaching. They wouldn't consider some other career. Right, under, I mean, I can imagine. Yeah. When, when you went to high school classrooms and began talking to students, did you find that they hadn't even considered engineering? Had they even heard uh, of engineering? That's essentially the situation, yes. Uh, so we set up programs that were on Saturdays where they could do small engineering experience. And that sort of thing is still being done because women, on the whole, don't stop to think about engineering or even any other science as a career. It's definitely true. I actually, I have a, a few questions um, about that. A lot of the engineering schools these days are consistently at numbers around 20% female. Yeah. With the exception of, of very unique programs. If you knew that um, when you were an undergrad, would you be surprised by, by this number or would you have thought maybe we would have come further? Well, I guess I hoped it would come further, right. but I'm glad it's as high as it is. <laughs> right, right. That's fair. Um, do, you, do you ever think that one day the image of an engineer won't be gender specific? Well, um, I think there's enough women engineers, you're 20 percent, um, and I think you'll find that more of the women go into for graduate degrees. Um, so. There are a fair number of women 
now in the field, and I don't think they're taken quite um, as, well, how do I want to put it, as being something unusual. Um, I know that when I was starting and working, that uh, the kind of comments that people in higher up positions, and you've got to expect these were men. Right, of course. Was, uh, that, well, we can't give you more responsibility because you're a woman, you're going to get married, and you're going to leave. <sighs> that would be one of the comments. Uh. Or, if you're already married, you don't need a raise because your husband's getting a raise. Right. Um, these are the kind of comments that you might encounter. I don't think they do that anymore. I think that's <laughs> something of the past. Yeah, I th certainly not. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually, I understand that you applied to work for GE after your undergrad and they um, they made an interesting comment to you and, and in my research I found that in the 70s GE had a, a whole campaign about how they were an equal employer yeah. and, and I was just wondering your experience and maybe how you felt when you saw that campaign come well, out <laughs> later. I, no, I think, I think it's good. Um, when I applied, when GE was interested in uh, hiring me, um, one of the comments, of course, was that uh, they couldn't pay me as much as a man, but I could make it up with overtime. Oh. Um, well, that didn't appeal to me, and so I did not go to work for GE. But that all of these companies, and I think, um, well, I don't have anything from the Society of Women Engineers right here, but I think all of these companies now do make an effort to have women and to have them on equal terms with men. Um, I'm not sure how uh, many women are at the top of companies, but at least the, um, it's beginning to make a difference. Right, certainly. Um, that was another thing that we did not have when I started, of course, was the Society of Women Engineers. Um, this was a group that we started um, so that um, women would have the same kind of advantage of a buddy system as men do. Um, they would know other people who are in um, engineering positions and who will, would be looking for people. And um, it, it, it was a support group, which was very nice. Oh, I know that you were actually pretty heavily involved with the Society of Women Engineers. Can you just fill us in on, on how you got involved and, and uh, for how long? Well, um, I don't remember exactly when the Society started in New York. And um, I, of course, was in Chicago, but we quickly, the few engineers that were in Chicago, um, decided that we would join and um, take part in it. Um, in Chicago, um, there was a Western Society of Engineers, and they had a... Women could be regular members of the society, but they also had what they called the Women's Council. And so there were... Um, Oh, I think maybe 20 of us, if that many, um, who were members. So we had a fairly nice group in Chicago of women engineers. A um, good portion of them worked for the telephone company. They started out, they were mathematicians, and started out with the telephone company and ended in up doing engineering work, which is a way a lot of women got into engineering was that they had a degree in mathematics or physics, maybe, and were doing that kind of work and found themselves then doing engineering. I'll ask about your mother and, and your sister, because they were, you know, females who were older than you and your family. Were they mathematically inclined, or did they no. encourage? No. Um, my mother um, never finished high school. She um, had to quit high school and go to business college 
to help support her family. Um, I think she was a very bright woman, but education-wise, she didn't have those advantages. Um, my sister was good in the sciences, um, but she was interested in physical education, and she went to Russell Sage College and got her uh, degree uh, in physical education from them, and then went to Syracuse University, where she got her master's. And so um, she worked primarily in that era. When she was in at Russell Sage, they tried awfully hard to get her to change to chemistry because she was so good in chemistry, but she didn't want to. So science definitely runs, yeah. runs in the family, especially with the girls. That's, that's very interesting. Um, also, actually, in looking at pictures of you when you were young, I was I was wondering. I imagine the image that that the boys had of of the girls coming into to RPI to be to be a little bit different than than how you looked. You were you were very pretty, and were, were people surprised that you weren't this masculine, tough kind of? Um, well, I suppose they were. Um, the thing is, one well. I don't know whether it was realistic or not, but at the time I went to RPI, they told me their decision whether they would accept more women would depend on how well I did. Wow. Which is a big burden to give somebody. Yeah, quite a bit of weight on your shoulders. So. Yeah. Um, but fortunately, um, most of the classes, um, though rigorous, were not hard for me. Um, and I think that's the advantage of, because I like math and science, and it was a logical thing for me to be studying. Um, at the time, as I said, there was only four girls, and all the rest were boys. Um, great odds. Oh, certainly. <laughs> what was your, your social life like as a student in, in that environment? Did, did you have? Well, in, in, uh, at RPI, I had very modified social life. Um, I took part in the uh, clubs and that sort of thing, but I didn't really date much. I dated a little bit, but not much. And it wasn't until I went on for advanced degrees that I started dating. But I, I was told by all my friends' mothers, ah. you know, you'll never marry because you'll have too much education and no man will want to marry you. Oh, is that that's what you're constantly told. Did you find <laughs> did you find that that wasn't the case? Once? It sure wasn't the yeah. case. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Despite the fact that I kept my maiden name, I did get married. Yes, yes, that's. And that's very different from your friend's mother's yeah. <laughs> initial predictions. Yeah. And I married a man that was equally smart or smarter. <laughs> <laughs> so I was very fortunate. Do you think that girls just need to take a more aggressive approach to math and science? Well, I don't know, you still hear dumb people saying women are no good at mathematics, and it just isn't true. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, um, a young woman in high school, they'll tell you, oh, you've got to study mathematics now and you're going to have trouble. That's the wrong thing to say because women don't necessarily have trouble. It's just like, um, I'm sure I could find a discipline where I'm not very good as opposed to the fact that I'm good at mathematics and physics and science. Right. Um, but to tell a woman ahead of time she's not going to be good in a field is, doesn't make sense. So you think that it's sort yeah. of the society's influence on young women that, yes. that keeps them away mm -hmm. when they're very young? Yeah, I think so. Do you think that if you, if you had had a mentor um, when you were younger, just another woman who maybe had, had gone through the journey before you did, do you think that would have helped you, or do you think that sort of being a pioneer is what pushed you? Well, um, I 
don't think it was necessary for me because once I made the commitment, I made the commitment. Um, sure, it might have helped in some ways, but um, the discrimination I felt really wasn't that much. I mean, wasn't that bad, I guess is what I want to say. When someone would say to me, well, um, you've got a lot of problems in the field that you're in. And I say, yes, but I like it. It's challenging. I'm much happier doing this than being somebody's secretary. <laughs> and um, so if I, maybe there's some discrimination, um, it doesn't bother me. I wasn't one of these women who went around with a chip on her shoulder. There were some of those who felt that this discrimination was too much, but I didn't feel that way. Did you feel you had a bit thicker skin than, than the average woman yeah. entering the field? Do you still have involvement? I mean, obviously, from what we've seen, you're um, in the, the newspapers at both RPI and um, the Illinois Institute of Technology, but do you still stay in touch with with the engineering societies or your, your old universities? No, um, I uh, retired when I was 60 and um, 25 years ago and I really haven't done anything in the field. Um, I've kept a little bit up to date but I'm, I'm really obsolete from the point of what's happening nowadays. The robotics, of, the, there's lots of things that are new that I not really up on. And you seem very humble. I, I can't help but wonder. I feel that if I saw a woman today being very successful in engineering, I might you know, smile a bit and feel that, take a little bit of credit. You don't, you don't seem to, to really to do that as much. But do you feel that, that you really had influence even on the women of today? Yes. Certainly. Mm -hmm. I think so too. I definitely do. <laughs> Um, I guess just just to close, do you, do you have any advice for, for young women today, just in their starting their journeys maybe at, at 10 or 12 or starting their college journeys at 18, 19, 20? Yeah, well my, my feeling is that um, don't take other people's evaluation of you in terms of saying what you can and cannot do. You can do what you want to do. If Even if you found one of the subjects difficult. If you like it, you're going to master it. And that's what matters. You should do what you want to do. Um, and I think there's lots of opportunities of all kinds nowadays that people should consider and not feel that they are limited to something specifically for women. <laughs> At the end of the day, do you ever do you ever compare yourself to your young idol, Amelia Earhart? Do you ever think that maybe you're just a little bit like her? I have no idea. <laughs> no? <laughs> I doubt it very much. Not as, I mean, maybe, maybe just as brave. A little bit different, but definitely brave. I just wanted to thank you very much for letting me talk to you. It's, it's well, been a, a pleasure entirely. Well, I enjoyed talking with you.